My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hello, and thank you for joining me for another episode of my podcast. My guest today is Shane Salk. Shane is an owner and partner in Shane Salk Productions and is an award-winning audio drama creator, producer, and sound designer. He's also uh, a, a great actor and writer as well. And um, he has projects that now have over 200 million impressions, spanning more than 150 countries around the world. Incredible uh, background. Shane, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I'm glad to be talking to you right now. Thank you. I really appreciate it, too. As I said earlier, you know, when I saw your IMDb page, I was a little bit nervous talking to you because I have a lot of respect for people who are doing what they love to do, what they feel called to do, you know, who are doing things in the creative uh, space and, and, you know, creative endeavors. It takes a lot to do all the different things that you're doing across the board and do it in an organized, deliberate way. So... So, I mean, you know, yeah. So when I saw all of that, I just said, hey, you got to give the guy props for this. Uh, you know, so tell me, how did you get started with acting and voice work? Which came first and why? Oh, well, I mean, I've, I enjoyed acting at a young age. You know, uh, I remember kindergarten, first grade, we'd put on, you know, plays and stuff. And I was the kid who was always actually memorizing their lines and not having the teacher whisper them off stage and things like that. I remember even uh, back, back. So we had four classes. There were like four kindergarten, first grade classes that would rotate. And one of the classes was drama. And we would do, we would put on plays and stuff every, I, I mean, it felt like every week, but I'm sure it was like every like month or every six weeks or something. And, um, and they were just based on books and stuff. And I remember one time I was playing a C, um, like a, an emperor, like the evil emperor and something. And the other, one of the other kids in the other class couldn't show up for the perform one of the performances. So they actually called me because we were doing it in our class and had him fill in because I had memorized all these words and I was so, you know, proud of this kinds of thing. Um, So I just really enjoyed doing that. And as I, you know, got older and older, I still enjoyed doing it. I wasn't like a child actor or anything, but I did stuff at the Seattle Children's Theater. I um, mean, their summer programs and and stuff like that and threw up high school. And even in high school, um, my brother used to do theater tech because he didn't like being on stage, but he liked building things and they made him do stuff. So he would do theater tech. And so I started doing theater tech and then I went to, you know, when people were saying, well, what do you want to go to college for? And I was like, well, just theater. That's that's it. That's what I want to do. So I went to theater for that. And I produced um, things as a student. And I was always working on something. And I mean, I was going through when I first got to college, I was I, I went through a, a large spout of depression and I it was very new to me. I didn't know what to do with it. And so I just tried to keep busy. So whenever I wasn't in class and I I didn't have homework or something and I was feeling awful, I would go to the theater and it would make me just being in the theater would make me feel better. And then the only thing that I could be doing then when you weren't in rehearsal or something was theater tech. So yeah. I would do theater tech. Um, so I learned lighting and, and tools and, and all, all the stuff and, and the producing element, because I never really wanted, I never liked the idea of waiting for someone else to give me something, you know, and when I got out of school, that's what it is, you know, you audition for all these things, but at the end of the day, you're waiting for someone to give you a job. True. So I started producing and I grew up listening to old time radio. Um, 
some people will know like the shadow and dragnet but i listen to so much more of things you've never heard of, like uh, sergeant press of yukon the lone ranger gunsmoke um the old comedy is bob hope um jack benny all these things that i could talk about for hours and when i got out of school it was 2008 and everything you know the the we were in a recession. Um, there was a uh, writer strike in Los Angeles. <sighs> LA had had just shut down, and I had just moved there. Um, I had a hard time getting a job, and I finally got a job as a telemarketer for the LA Philharmonic. Like that's where we were at. And uh, uh, at the time, I somebody had talked to me about, you know, producing things, and uh, we decided on producing an audio a radio drama and i was like yes we can do like this is what we should do because i know this so well and unbeknownst to them like i had had this huge background so um we made we're alive which we launched in 2008 2009 and that's when the voiceover stuff started um and that's that's when the major producing I had produced, you know, plays and, and some stuff like that and, and was working with some other people on some short films. But that was the first one that, you know, out of school that I really like threw myself into for, for many, many years. And we were writing it and producing it. Um, and through that, I got into the voiceover world and started meeting uh, Bill Holmes, William Holmes, who is my business partner now. Um, and we produced a version of a Christmas Carol, um, which, uh, is incredible. It has, you know, Maurice LaMarche and Rob Paulson, who you'll know is Pinky in the Brain in it. Uh, Neil Flynn, who is the janitor from Scrubs and the father from the middle. A lot of people who are in our current show, Car Serum, first, I was first introduced in Christmas Carol and they loved doing that so much. They jumped at the chance of coming back and working with us again. Um, but I really, um, I met Bob Bergen, who uh, you'll know is the voice of Porky Pig. And he is such a nice person. He's the one who actually introduced me to Bill. Um, and he has been so supportive. So it, the voiceover community is such a supportive and inclusive community in, in so many ways. At least to me, they were very welcoming. And it's not as, you know, backstabbing as some, some other parts of the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, I did. I, I, I was acting this whole time. Uh, I was the genie on Disney Cruise Line in between Christmas Carol and anything else. And I moved to New York. Um, and that's on stage. So my, my first love is still performing. I, I miss theater greatly. Um, I did films and TV and I, I miss doing that greatly. But at the moment, I'm, I'm focused on running this studio and doing these other projects to, you know, as stepping stones to get somewhere else. Do you were you um when you first really got interested in voiceover work to was there a particular person or program that really inspired you the most i mean when you talk about the shadow you know the lone ranger i remember all of those alfred hitchcock presents um so many of these serials that were you know pre-television but then yeah after television came out, you did have some really, really well produced mm -hmm. uh, TV, um, well, I shouldn't say TV, but dramas or even serials like The Hitchhiker's Guide. I think that was very well, well done. Yeah. Were there, was there one or two that really, really inspired you or were there individuals like Orson Welles? You, you know, they're just like, wow. Uh, I mean, I usually say that the one, the, the show that influenced me the most was Gunsmoke. Um, which was a long running radio show before it was a long running TV show. Um, and the way that they did the writing and the sound design was more realistic than many of the other shows to me. So I, I, I remember very vividly a number of moments in that show and they painted the pictures so well there, there's a, a, a moment in Christmas Carol that we produced where it's about two minutes or two and a half minutes or something of pretty much silence. There's no talking and, and, you know, any talking there is, that's not really painting any pictures. You know, I think at one point, you know, some kids run past Scrooge. He's walking home from his counting house 
and some kids run by and goes, watch where you're going. You know, it doesn't paint too much of a picture. Um, but there is a, there's a part in Gunsmoke um, in one of the episodes. It's a very short where Matt Dillon, the, the sheriff, is walking from the jail to a bar where he has to confront the bad guy or whatever. And there is no talking. All it is is the sounds of the bar getting closer and closer and closer and him, his footsteps and the, the pace that he's walking and the jingling of his spurs and his guns and all this stuff. And it's so realistic and it paints this such... And then the doors open and everything even gets louder and it's it paints this picture so well and the the dramatic tension um is it 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 just influenced me to go you can really paint any of these pictures without saying anything yeah. and i think that's that's what it has influenced me more than pretty much anything else yeah i think i think i remember jack benny in the shadow Mm -hmm. I think those were one, those were radio programs that really stuck in my mind as a child because yeah. I, who doesn't want to be the shadow? <laughs> well, know? it's so interesting because the shadow also had the, it's not a problem, but the, you know, if anybody that doesn't know the shadow, one of the things he does is basically gets in people's minds and makes himself look invisible. And so how do you portray the idea of invisibility on a radio show? Yeah. And so they do some modifications to his voice, but every time you hear that modification of the voice, you picture, you know that this person can't see the shadow. And one of the things about so many different programs that I listen to is it, there is nothing that, that can be done with film and TV that I believe can't be done with audio. Um, and if there is, I'm still willing to try it. Um, I've had arguments with people that you can't, you know, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. And I'm like, yeah, you, we can't. Um, we do, when we do car serum, we change perspectives on people all the time. We, we design that like it's a movie. So we talk about it as in like the camera's pushing in on this person. Um, this person's over here, that person's over there, and this is the shape of the room. Um, and, and you really can immerse yourself in these environments. And that's what's so utterly cool about this, this medium is that people think you can't do certain things. And we're here to go, well, let's try it. Let's do it. Um, yeah, between the acting and the writing and then the sound and the pacing, it seems like you could pull it off if you've got all of those factors thinking up together. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, what is Carcerum? What is its focus and purpose and audience? What's this all about? You know, who's going to really dig it? Who may not? Yeah, um, I think anybody can dig it if you can put yourself in the space so car serum is a high fantasy audio series uh full cast full sound effects cinematic sound effects original scripts um original musical score and it's it's like listen it's it's a mix between princess bride and game of thrones or princess B bride and lord of the rings um if it puts you into this world and it's one of my favorite things is when people come up to us and go so i was watching your show and this is what i blah 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 and we're like well you you didn't watch anything that we put out you listened to it and you saw a movie and you saw everything in your head and that's what our job is it's not to get you to see exactly what what i see or what bill sees it's to see something in your you're a better designer than i'm going to be i'm not a great visual <laughs> like designer like that right. so uh, i'm not a cinematographer but you are in your own brain it's like reading a book it activates the same parts of the brain where you go well when i'm reading a book i see where these characters are and the environments um so i mean definitely if you love fantasy you're gonna love it but we have people that are like yeah i don't like fantasy but i love this because the way we again activate your brain um it's it's 
entertaining and it's it's a it's an active experience for the listener you can't listen to it and we've had a number of people say this you can't listen to it when you're cleaning the house or you know you know doing chores and you kind of have it on the background like a lot of podcasts ours is an experience you know maybe when you're driving because you're doing one thing and you're listening to this show but um I had somebody tell me that they tried to listen to it at work and they ended up just staring at their computer for 20 minutes and not working. And they're like, I can't do this at work. Um, and that's a compliment. Yeah. That's, it's what we're going for. It's not, it's yeah. not a passive experience. Cause if you can zone out while listening to it, it's really not doing its job. Yeah. You know, the, I, the whether it's conversation or a type of narrative. Yeah. And, and uh, I have people that I know, um, we've had people comment, say, my favorite way to listen to this is I just go into my room, lay down, turn off all the lights, close my eyes and listen to it and really immerse myself in it. Um, I have a number of people that say what they love to do is listen to the whole, like each episode twice because they get everything in the first ep first time listening. But when they go back, they get all the little nuances and they, they, their focus can be in other places because they know what's going to be happening and what's going to be said. Um, so it's, it is really, really fun for me to hear how people like to enjoy this because it's not, it's not a proven, it's, it's not so mainstream that people go, Oh, it's a movie. I turn it on. I turn off the lights or I turn it on. I play on my phone or I turn it on. Like these are how I experience these things. We have to sort of, train the audience for the first few episodes how to listen to this but one of my biggest things is we never talk down to the audience we never pretend that the audience or, or think the audience isn't going to get it we design it to trust the audience i don't have people going well i'm going to walk over there now because the audience knows what footsteps sound like and i don't care if you see a red door a green door a blue door and you know what a door sounds like. So someone can go, screw you. And then we hear footsteps and a door slam and you come up with whatever it is in your head. Right. Yeah. Let me ask you. So Carcerum has been around for a couple of years now, at least. Uh, well, we launched uh, uh, 2020 on okay, so, 22nd. So um, fantasy, but with elements of s at least slight humor. Is that yeah, there is definitely humor in it. And it's it's in a fantasy world but we really write and design around characters and relationships so that's why a lot of people are like i don't like fantasy but i like this it's like because it's just in a fantasy world you're connecting with the characters and the situations that's why you enjoy it it's not resting on this idea of you know well you know what fantasy is and it's all these other things it's it's first a good story second it's good relationships and third it's great acting now you s correct me if I'm wrong. So it sounds like you started Carcerum, then it somewhere COVID came. How did that heavy sigh? How did that? <laughs> I mean, how did that impact the production, the distribution, uh, the perpetuation of it? Because it's an ongoing series, right? Yeah, well, we're we're in between seasons right now. Um, I started working on on a Carcerum like thing, you could say, many years ago, trying to uh, get raise money, trying to prove and and convince people that there is this medium, if it's produced incredibly well, um, has a a very big place in the world. Um, but Carcerum itself, we had our first writers group, um, I want to say 2018. Um, yeah, I want to say the summer of 2018. Um, and then we started, you know, we got 32 episodes written because my big thing is we need to write every, we need to write the full season before we start recording Yeah. because we can't do this episode by episode. We bring actors in, some of these actors, we go, look, they get all their stuff done in a session, two sessions and we're done. Um, and then we cut it together. Um, we started recording January of 2020. Our first actors came in to record at 
January 2020 because we got the scripts done and everything. And then COVID hit. Um, we were planning on launching the series, I think, April or May. Um, and obviously that stopped. That was no longer the plan. Um, we had some some big meetings and stuff set up. We were going to go out to New York for this big event to try to publicize, and that event was canceled. Um, and we really designed this show for commuters because they're about 20 minutes, 20, 25 minute episodes. The average drive time in the U.S. is 15 minutes to work. Mm. Um, wow. And so we, we stopped the launch. Um, we hadn't really publicized when the launch was yet, so that was good. And, and we took a number of months to get, you know, make the production better, which was great. It, it was a blessing in itself to, you know, have that time and see how long this whole thing was going to go on. And then we just decided to launch. Um, it made things harder because we didn't have, uh, we did, I changed, you know, everything was remote. We recorded actors remote. The good thing about a lot of our the voiceover community and and is that they have home setups, so we can utilize those. When we did have people come into the studio, we followed very strict protocol. You know, keep everybody separate. You know, sterilize everything, all that stuff. But it it was um, it was quite a change, and and promotion changed. You know, so many people started doing radio podcasts or or audio series that some i had i i found that sometimes it became created a buzzword where people were like oh you're doing one of those yeah and i'm like well we've been working on this for so long it's not just something thrown together um but all of it everything changed the whole world changed and we adapted to it and that's why we're successful at what we do a lot of the time is because you know, even with the actors, you know, an actor would come in and we'd have an idea of what this character was and the actor would do something else. And we're like, okay, well, let's change. We rewrote scenes around actors. Cameron Crowe, uh, the, the famed director. Sure. He came in. Um, miraculously, we became, you know, friends with him and in, in touch because of, of a series of events. And he was like, well, I'll do your show. That sounds like fun. And we're like, okay. And we had him come in. And we had him do this character that was written completely differently. And we changed the entire scene because he came in and sounded differently than it was in our head. And it, it was this, it was this very serious scene and we changed it into this comedic scene. But I mentioned that one cause it's Cameron Crowe, but that is a story that happened 20 times throughout the, the season, the, the whole thing it's adapting. So we adapted for uh, COVID, we adapted for the actors it's a movable object at all times. And that's why, you know, that's why the things happen that they do and why it feels like everybody was, you know, all the parts were written for that actor. Cause in many ways it was, that's how we designed it. Do you think because of this, because of COVID that there is more opportunity in, in podcasting and voice work? that there's more availability for doing things remotely or is it pretty much the same or has it impacted it in a, in a different way? I mean, everything changed. Um, it's the industry has changed dramatically because, because of COVID a lot of, you know, even commercials and, and things like that, they're requiring home studios. So all of these voiceover actors and other actors started setting up home studios because they couldn't do anything else. They couldn't go into studios or, or audition yeah. el elsewhere. Um, and then a number, a lot of people got into voice acting because they couldn't be on set or in theaters, which is both great and not great because a lot of people are scared that we're not going to, you know, a lot of people are worried that we're not going to get back to this place where, oh, yeah, well, companies will send people into studios because, you know, big companies are going, well, why would we do that? We don't have to. So many people have home studios. We're just not going to pay for studios anymore. Um, and there are so many more people that a lot of times people who aren't, haven't been in the voiceover world for so for a long time are like, well, I'll do anything for any amount of money. So you'll have major companies going, yeah, we're going non-union because we can and we don't care. Um, so yes, 
at the same time, a lot of companies are realizing that they're like, wow, we took some things for granted because uh, we've never had to work without studios. And so, so many actors and so many producers and, and, and uh, companies are going, we can't wait to get back to studios because it was so much easier. <laughs> and we got such better performances when the actor's not worried about, you know, is my gain up? Is my gain down? Am I popping? Am I doing this? Because you have an engineer worrying about all that stuff. Um, uh, a lot of people started doing podcasting. And I don't think it means that there's more, I don't think there's more opportunity to do podcasting than before. I just think more people are aware of the ability they have to do it. Um, but there are a lot more of them out there. So yeah. in some ways um, it's hard because you, so many people are tired of filtering out things they don't like because there's so many more of them. But at the same time, you know, the question is, do the, you know, does the cream rise to the top where if you really care about your quality and care about your story or care about your podcast, it's not just making content and leaning on this idea that, well, you know, for a radio drama or radio series, you're like, well, it's a radio series, so we can get away with things. People will forgive us. If you don't lean on that idea, then you make a better product. Yeah. You would think that if it's, it's, if it's a high quality production that over time it's going to attract more people if you promote it if you mm -hmm. are really putting it out there if the marketing is 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 good and, and yeah. consistent and is, you know and it is hard because there are big companies that are starting to get into this stuff that have the budgets for marketing and have the budgets for you know all you know promotion that many of us don't um, so it can get very frustrating some of the time with that. And there are, because there are so many of them, sometimes there are publications that are like, yeah, we don't do podcasting anymore because there are so many people that started a podcast, you know, celebrities and non-celebrities that, um, some people just got kind of tired of it. And they're like, yeah, no, everybody has a podcast. Nobody cares. Um, but then there are awards, you know, we've won a number of awards um, because some of these festivals are starting to realize that there is a great art in what we do. And um, I think, and I, you know what, I will say COVID helped with this, but um, because of it, people can't ignore what we do. So if I want to listen to Carcerum, which I do now, <laughs> so before I wasn't sure. Now, okay. now, it, now it sounds pretty good. So if I want to listen to it, can I download it from Podcast Addict or, or anywhere Spotify? you get your podcasts? Uh, you can get it just Carcerum, or you can go to www.carcerumtheseries.com. That's C A R C E R E M the series.com, and you can. We have tons of behind the scenes videos there, but you can also click the links to. Um, wherever you get your podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, no. um, Samsung. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna definitely uh, subscribe to it today. I, I love podcasts. So when you began Car Serum, you already had the first season prepared? Uh, when we first launched? Yeah, did you already have, all the episodes for that first season already written out. In other words, you knew the ending to the before, first season. Before we started recording, we had all of the series written. So that's why it took us, you know, from the first writers to us recording was so long because we had 32 episodes to write. Um, when we when we put out the first episode, I think we had about five done. And then we were chasing our tail. We were designing and recording and, and it was, it was a rough one. I don't think I'll ever do that again um, that way because the quality that we want doesn't allow for, and, and it nearly killed us. So next time we'll have probably at least 15 episodes in the can before we, we launch the next season, but we are going to start writing it. From a writer's perspective, and this is really where I wanted to get to, and I don't know how much of a hand you have in the actual writing of Carcerum. And I was the, the head writer of that one. 
So a lot. Yeah. I remember that there was an old quote, you may have heard this from Mickey Spillane, that he always knew the ending before he would sit down to write because the ending was the lantern at the end of the road. A million percent. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to ask you. So as far as writer's block, did you ever experience that? And if you did, did Mickey's approach help or hinder? Um, so the way we worked it is we actually had a weekend. We gathered a number of friends, writers, um, and we sat there. And the first day we kind of created the world of what Carcerum uh, our Aru was going to be and then we started bullet pointing you know episodes and what was going to happen and and we got through uh, about 15 episodes that second day um and right you know we would talk and and think what happened and then I took all of those bullet points and we had a couple meetings afterwards just nights to try to flush out the rest of the series um but we I took all those bullet points. I broke them down into episodes. So it was episode one. These are the bullet points. Episode two. These are the bullet points. Episode three. And once I had the 30, 32 episodes bullet pointed, I started passing them out to uh, writers to give a first draft of the writing. Um, Aaron Castellan and uh, Laura Davey um, would write an episode and then give it to me. And then I'd change it or, or, not change it depending on what needed to happen to make sure that all of the characters had the same voice that we were covering all of the the bullet points that we needed um and i would sometimes add or subtract things because of the audio version stuff but um i always tell people to write like a movie because you have mm -hmm. to change a lot less than you think you do um to make it radio um but it took a very long time to do all of this um but yes we had all those bullet points laid out um and they can change um but because we had different people writing different scripts we needed to make sure that all of these things were hit because something that happened in episode two might come back in episode 10 and somebody else might be writing that episode so um before we put pen to paper for scripts we knew exactly what was going to happen so when it comes to what you're what you have done with car serum so far and what you want to continue with it i'm assuming mm -hmm. were you a big uh enthusiast of world building type of science fiction like dune or more like the disconnected kind of approach like what ray bradbury used to do where he would throw different short stories at you and then when it's finally over you see how they're all connected you know I'm what i mean much, yeah i'm much more i mean i can't say like i liked lord of the rings and all that stuff but i wouldn't say you know i wouldn't say fantasy is my genre of choice in like just everything i do my thing is always about the story and the relationships between people the characters um, that's what i like that's really my my favorite part of it so we can take those stories and those um relationships and put them into any world whether it's sci-fi fantasy i mean we're alive was a zombie thing so people love it because it's not just you know these people thrown into this world and then you see a bunch of action and and it doesn't really fit well, the first time I saw The Matrix, I, uh, you know, sci-fi was never really my genre when I was a kid. Um, but I remember seeing the first Matrix and not really feeling that it was sci-fi. I mean, it clearly was sci-fi, but it wasn't. It was the story and the relationships and, and the thing that he was going through that I really, really loved. It wasn't the sci-fi part that I loved. Um. And that's, again, how I look at all of these things. It's what would this person do in this situation? Are you familiar with the hero's journey? I, I not very well, but I do know of it. The whole, because I, I, I took 
creative writing in college. I always wanted to be a writer. Then, of course, you graduate, you see the real world. You're like, wait a minute, I can't make any money doing this. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's sitting around eating spam and ramen and you can't get anywhere. So the hero's journey is basically saying all of these great epics have this very, very similar format, which obviously the Matrix adheres to the Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. um, adheres to. So I wanted to ask you how you felt about having that as like an, you know, like a general structure basically saying, hey, look, if we're going to do Carcerum, it's got to have a beginning, middle and an end or or it has to have at the very least an arc. And then season two can have another arc and we keep doing it like that. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's what makes a story you know every episode has that beginning middle and end um every character has their own arc you know we say there's there's the major arc of of the season and then there's the major arc of the series and then each character has a growth if the character doesn't grow or change at all they're boring they're nobody can relate to that because they're like wow you haven't changed through this entire thing. I think it's very important to have that structure. And, uh, you know, there are, I 100% believe that there are ways that you could, you know, I can't think of them, but you could write outside of that, you know, especially with, with uh, you know, avant-garde something. But uh, there, you know, we go throughout our day and have, we are different from the, at the beginning of our day based different than the end of the day we have a daily arc right um and so i again i come back to you write the re reality of the person um and you can't have someone experience something without changing yeah if you're not growing as a person then your life is pretty dull and so... you can become a worse person but that's yeah. also still a change. It is still in interesting. Art. Yeah, it's still interesting if you become a royal, you know what? So, I mean, like, I remember being floored the first time I saw the movie The Hustler with Paul oh. Newman. Uh, and um, Piper Laurie was in it, I think. Yeah, she was. She got, she was Oscar nominated and she is in our show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that and I saw her name and I remember thinking, what well, was not she in that movie? But I remember being floored by that movie because I thought it was pretty simple, really. But I thought it was really well acted, very, very well acted, really. And that that's really what made the movie. But by the time you got through the end of the movie, you really felt like, wow, oh, man, you felt like you had been through it. Yeah. With these characters. So I think that's really what gave it the the resonance as a movie. So let me just switch gears a little bit if if I can, because I could talk about the craft of writing and doing creative things all day long. But at the end of the day, this is a business for you, I'm assuming anyway. I mean, you got to have some way to buy spam and, and noodles, you know, noodles and noodles. <laughs> right. So what challenges did you have gearing this up trying to get it to the point where you could have Shane Salk productions being self-sustaining or, you know, being able to do what you love to do and being able, you know, to, to, to get from point A to point B, you know? Yeah. Um, a lot. There's a lot of challenges. Um, I spent, 10 years or so trying to pitch the idea of doing a epic show, like a cinematic show. Um, and people didn't want to listen. I've had meetings with, with people and they'd ask me questions and they'd not understand. And, and yeah. they think it was, you know, I had, I sat down at a meeting once and the guy goes, all right, nobody's going to listen to this. And I said, then why are we here? <laughs> like, if that's already what you believe, then what's up that's her hard uh, sell yeah yeah i was like well you know here we go um we then um an opportunity came along to actually take over a recording part of a recording studio so we decided to do that and at the same time make the studio the rental studio and all that stuff try to make that um profitable and then at the same time 
we can produce our show. We don't have to do, you know, rent space. Um, and so it became even harder because it was producing this show at the same time as running this business and running the studio. And anybody that's ever tried to start a business knows the first couple of years, not necessarily profitable. Um, I will be honest. I, you know, in a lot of way, I'm so proud of Carcerum. Like we've won a number of awards and while it's absolutely great and I'm always thrilled, it doesn't necessarily make me more aware of how proud I feel of the production that we put together. Um, because I just think that we worked so hard at making it such a great production. And it's so great when other people recognize that. But whether they recognize it or not doesn't affect my belief in how good the production is. Um, but doing all that while not taking funds out of it, and we finally got some people to believe in us and, and gave us basically loans to make this show and to start the studio... Um, and I've never run a business before, you know, um, it is still a struggle every day. It's a struggle and, and trying to find a work-life balance is really what I'm trying to, to focus on now where I yeah. don't feel like if I leave the studio for a day, everything's going to fall apart and we're losing all these opportunities and things. And that's not a way to live. You can't live that way. Um, so I don't remember what the original question was. I'll be honest with you, but I think I got somewhere around there. <laughs> yeah, you, you 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 got close to it. You, I mean, I mean, basically, you're trying to grow a business while you're doing the business. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. and you know, I don't know if hindsight really is twenty twenty, but I mean, if you were to have a younger version of yourself come up and say, mm -hmm. "Hey, I want to be a, a voice actor." what would what would you say i mean would you just say don't no i would never tell someone not to do something that they really truly wanted to do um i will if it's voice actor i would say you know take classes take your time which is never something anybody wants to hear um, yeah. but it's true it's you know don't put a demo together before you're ready to make a demo mostly because if you're going to get better than your demo in 2 months don't spend the money to make a demo. Get better and then make your demo because you're yeah. going to you're going to get more talented than your demo too quick. Um if you're going to start, you know, for if someone wants to start a podcast like we do, um there's definitely things that I would tell them like, look, these are the things that I worried about that I didn't need to worry about. Um I believed that um you know, one tweet from a celebrity was going to get us a million downloads kind of thing. And that's just not the way it works at yeah. all. Um, you can't lean on any of that. You know, the product is good. And so we're happy with it and people will find it and love it. Um, but it's, it's a challenge and everything takes longer than you think it's going to. I made, you know, I made the, mis not the mistake, but I had the idea that the way things I did back in 2009 would work today in this market and it's not true it's a totally different market with podcasting back in 2009 20 percent of people knew what a podcast was now it's 80 85 percent um and so many more people listen to podcasts but there are so many more of them yeah um it's i mean it always comes down to the product first the story the the design and then um the the promotion is a whole other ball game. It really is. A yeah, whole other marketing ball game. is not for the faint of heart. I mean, it's like they say it's rough out there. Wear wear a cup. I mean, it, it, you really have to know what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. You know who you've got to connect with, who can help you, and everything. It helps if you have all of those together before jumping yeah. in. You know, I mean, but don't don't think you get you know Brad Pitt your podcast that that is the magic key that's going to get you a whole bunch of listens and a whole bunch of things it's not necessarily the way it works you think it is but it's not yeah to to what well i want to i don't want to digress or go too divergent but i want to get your take on some other related topics if if i may 
Please. What do you think about podcasters and for that matter, business owners participating in there's virtual summits, there's podcast, um, podcasters events i can't remember what the term is podcast movements there's conventions yeah are those what do you think of those because you're definitely a podcaster you're definitely a voice expert okay (laughs) so what what's your take on these things it depends on what you're trying to get out of it i went to i was a speaker at podcast movement this year i did a, a a talk on immersive sound design um or i think immersive fiction yeah um uh there's podcast uh pod fest and i i was a speaker there i it depends what you're trying to get out of it i think they're great for the ones that i've been to they're great for if you're trying to get ideas and and you have good uh you're you're, you want to hear some people talk who have been through some things or if you want to, you know, meet people within the community, they're great. Um, I, it wouldn't be a, a place that would necessarily, you know, some people go cause they just want to uh, promote their stuff. And while you can do that, you're talking to other podcasters. Um, Good point. I w- yeah. I would mm. say that, you know, uh, I don't do, I don't do, you know, guests on my shows. So, I'm not a great one to talk about, you know, whether you can find good guests for your shows there or not. Um, I will say, be care, you know, go do some research and, and again, what do you want to get out of it? Um, if you expect to go and then because of it, get a million downloads, you know, a thousand downloads, it's probably not what's going to happen. But if you're going to learn something that, um, that could be a good reason to go. Um, it's not a fan convention. The ones that I've been to aren't fan conventions. They're more educational conventions. Um, and then there are there are some things where uh, big companies will have somebody go and give a talk and you go to the talk and basically it feels like it's just a promotional event for their show or their thing or whatever. Yeah, many do. Um, yeah. And you're like, well, I didn't really learn anything from you. I just sat here and you, you know, tried to sell me a condo for 20, you know, 40 minutes. Um, But when I went, I I physically went, I was very scared because of COVID and everything, but I did go to Tennessee and I was very careful as much as I could to give a talk in person. And there were people there that loved just being there just being surrounded by other podcasters and going to these talks and learning and and uh finding people that were like them and uh if that's what you want it's great yeah it's really weird in a way i mean when i hear you talking about that it brings back a lot of memories for me because i mean as you know as a web developer which i never wanted to be but I became that because I couldn't, you know, work in writing. But I remember going to these uh, conventions for web developers. There's one called WordCamp, you know, for all WordPress mm-hmm. developers. But I always remember going there and thinking, there's really nothing that I can't do technically. But it's like, do I really want to talk to other programmers? Do I really want? Do I want to talk to people who are at this beginning level? Mm-hmm. Who are you going to talk to? And I would go and just kind of stand around, you know, with my thumb up the, you know, the, 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 the backside, you know, just trying to figure out like, well, why am I here? I'm not really getting anything accomplished. Mm-hmm. And I think with, with COVID, I have to say is it's made me much more methodical and, and deliberate, you know, which is really kind of weird in a way. You wouldn't expect a global pandemic to make you more methodical and more deliberate with what you do and why you do it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But just hearing you say that made me think of that because I used to go to networking events because I felt bored. Right. But then I'm like, wait a minute. Why don't you just read a book? Again, it's it's what you want to get out of it. Yeah. Why why you want to go. That's key. You want to get out of it. Yeah. Um, and that's my that's my biggest thing about many things. 
networking events, everything else. It's, well, why do you want to go? Um, and, you know, it's, I, I, if I go to a networking event, I would rather talk to somebody for, you know, one person the entire time than meet a uh, hundred people yeah. a second and ha hand them a card. That, that's what I always did. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, if I met you at a networking event, I would want to know what projects you're working on. Yeah. And then which one is like the most nascent? Well, I'd rather walk away and I have I have friends who I could call right now who I met at a networking event because we talked about whatever the heck we wanted to for yeah. two hours. Um, and whether that's about our projects or just about the world or anything, I'd rather walk away from a networking event with a friend than have a hundred people with my business card that's going to get thrown away. Because that one person who's your friend is now an ally and, you know, you guys, you can help each other out if, if that happens. But that was, this, you know, a meeting that I have. Some people go into meetings going, if I don't get this thing, it's not a successful meeting. And I completely disagree. I go, if you walk out of that meeting with another ally who maybe didn't give you anything, but goes, you know, I like what you're doing. You know, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. I have an ally and, uh, and that's, that's a successful meeting to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that a hundred percent. Um, let me ask you now you're involved. I mean, everything you say, there's like so much more that I could add to it, but I'm trying to stop <laughs> myself because there's either stories or anecdotes that I'm thinking, but I wanted to try to be focused. So as hard as it is, so you have more going on than just Carcerum. Can you get into that? Because I want to make sure that we cover everything you're working on, if that's possible. Well, yeah, we, we are working on, uh, we, we have our writer's summit for season two of Carcerum uh, next month. So that's great. Um, we do, um, when COVID started, we were very depressed and, you know, the, the mm. studio very much shut down to, to outside people and we didn't know what to do. So my business partner, Bill, he had, he's in his sixties and he had always wanted to host the original match game. So what we started doing was we started on Fridays, we started doing live game shows that he could host. And so we have these, these live game shows that we do. Um, oh, we have a new website. You can watch them at craptv.online. That's C-R-A-P-T-V dot online. Okay. So we do, we do live game shows every other Friday. Um, and you can watch past ones. And, and because, you know, Bill's been around for so long, we get really cool guests. Um, to, to be on, but it's all for fun. It's all, you know, we're not making money off of it. It's all for fun to keep us entertained. Um, we're also working on another audio series called Hawk, which is still being written, but it's a very dystopian noir show. Um, and we run the studio. We do a lot of, you know, video games and uh, commercials and, and stuff like that. So anything to keep ourselves entertained and busy is really what we have going on here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and as the world opens up, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, I miss theater greatly. I miss acting uh, outside of the booth greatly. Um, but, uh, but I'm, I'm really happy with the people that I work with and, and the environment that we've created for ourselves. Um, and that's, that's a, a huge accomplishment to myself. Yeah, it is. It is. And, um, you know, slowly things are going to continue opening up more. So I think as long as you're doing work that you enjoy, you're expressing yourself creatively and you're earning, you know, a living doing it, then I don't think that there's really much of a higher, you know, avocation than that. Right. So uh, do you have any closing thoughts or anything else you'd like to uh, get some attention drawn to, if at all possible? Uh. No, I mean, just carcerumtheseries.com. You can find us on, on uh, social media at Carcerum the Series anywhere. Uh, and honestly, I'd love to hear what people think about it. Um, you know, you can direct message me, direct message. You, you can message us on the website, anywhere. But we also, um, I'll mention that we, uh, we also design it with the visually impaired in mind. 
Um, and I want to do much more in that community. And, and I would love to hear from more visually impaired people. I'm, I'm in contact with the uh, American Center for the Blind. Um, and we're talking about doing some things together. That's and great. I find that fascinating and, and very exciting. Um, but yeah, just carcerum the series. Tell your friends. Okay. Well, listen, Shane, I had a blast talking to you. Please stick around for another minute or two. Absolutely. And, uh, for those out there watching or listening, I want to thank you for your time. If you enjoyed this podcast, do not forget to like and subscribe and share it with other people out there who you think may benefit from it or who may enjoy the discussions as well. So take care, everybody, and thanks. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.